Welcome to this topic of the Demystifying IPv6 course on IPv6 Addressing. IPv6 Addressing is actually broken out into two parts, so there will be two separate topics and this is part one. So as you can see from this slide comparing the IPv4 address space which uses 32 binary bits to the IPv6 address space which uses 128 binary bits, there is a big difference in the number of available addresses. 4.29 billion with IPv4, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th which is a large number of addresses, in fact 340 undecillion addresses where undecillion is actually a billion 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 billion. There's all kinds of statistics that you find regarding the size of the IPv6 address space, such as there should be enough IPv6 addresses to label every grain of sand on the earth. Another one that's mentioned on this slide is there's 665 sextillion addresses per meter squared of the earth's surface. Just to get an idea of how big a sextillion is, as you can see it's a one followed by 21 zeros which translates to 1 billion trillion. Well how is the IPv6 address space represented to us? Of course binary bits are always stored within the computer's memory but we tend to simplify it for us human beings so when we write things down or see things read out on a computer screen uh, like let's say if you're looking at a route table or something like that it makes more sense. So in order to represent that, first the 128 bits are divided up into eight double octet fields or blocks of 16 bits each. The way this is written and displayed to us is documented in RFC 4291, the IPv6 architecture. Each 16-bit block that's represented on the previous slide is converted to hexadecimal and delimited with colons. So the resulting representation is called colon hexadecimal. So even though what you see below still looks a little bit unwieldy to us human beings, it's definitely better than looking at 128 binary ones and zeros. This slide depicts an example collection of IPv6 addresses just to get you used to what you might be seeing out there in the real world. Actually, the first address is not an IPv6 address, it's actually an Ethernet MAC address. It's a multicast MAC prefix 33 colon 33 that's used when mapping down IPv6 multicast addresses down to an Ethernet multicast MAC address. More about that on a subsequent slide. The second items are what's referred to as IPv4 compatible addresses. So it's a way to embed IPv4 addresses into the IPv6 address space with really no other IPv6 prefix information. In fact, all of those have been deprecated or are no longer in use today. There's a lot of other addresses types that are listed on this specific screen. Addresses such as FC01, 2001, 3FFE, FE80, 2002, FFO2. We'll learn more about what those actual prefix represent, but they do represent some specific type of IP address in the IPv6 address space. And some of the last items on the slide, uh, 0200 colon slash 3 is the what's referred to the aggregatable global IPv6 space, really the public IPs that are in use today, and then a couple of other special addresses, colon colon 1 colon colon, that we'll discuss on some future slides too. So the next step in making the IPv6 addresses a little bit easier to work with and view for us human beings is a concept of being able to remove or compress zero spaces in the 16 blocks that I mentioned before. So as you can see, leading zeros can be omitted. A block of all zeros can be represented with a colon colon. So as you can see, the top address that starts with 21DA has got reduced in size. Instead of 00D3, it's just D3. Instead of four zeros, we can represent it that with just one zero. The zero before the 2AA has been omitted as well. The two zeros before FF have been omitted as well. Also, successive 16 blocks of zeros may be simplified or compressed using a double colon. So a long string of bytes 
that have all zeros. In this case, FFO2 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 2, it can actually be represented as FF02 colon colon 2. may not be obvious, but there are certain limitations to removing and compressing zeros because it becomes ambiguous as to what they actually started out to be. So trailing zeros within a 16 block cannot be removed. Also, the idea of compressing multiple 16 blocks of zeros using the colon colon can only be performed once, and you'll see why on the next slide. The reason the double colon can only be used once is the way that you can reverse engineer just how many zeros were actually compressed. So if you look at the result, how many of the eight 16 blocks are left? Subtract that many and then multiply that by 16 and then you get the exact number of zeros that were actually compressed. Obviously if this was done more than once there would be no way to figure this out. So IPv6 prefixes and you know over the course of the history of the internet and IP addressing in general a prefix was used to indicate the routable portion of the address from your point in the ne network hierarchy. So as per CIDR you know different points like the core of the internet will use shorter prefixes your organization will use uh, prefixes plus subnets and then there even may be like host specific routes. And so an IPv6 prefix is represented as an IPv6 address slash the length. And that's again came from the CIDR or classless interdomain routing scheme. So as you can see here if we have an example prefix of the, the hex 12 AB followed by some zeros a CD3 and we wanted to indicate that it was a 60-bit prefix there's different ways of representing it. For instance, uh, in the first example, uh, remember the trailing zeros cannot be omitted. In fact, that's the whole prefix completely written out. Uh, in the second example, double colons have been inserted to represent the two 16-bit blo blocks of zero, but of course that could only be used once. And then, because all the trailing bits in this prefix are zero, in other words, the interface portion, which we'll talk more about later, is just represented by zeros, then we can use the double colon to compress the end of the address instead of the beginning because there's more zeros that are actually being compressed. So in certain cases, it's beneficial to write the entire node address and indicate its prefix to so you can combine the two concepts where if the entire node address is as depicted in the first example below and its subnet was as depicted in the previous example with the 60-bit prefix then the entire address can be written out slash 60. Keeping in mind that with IPv6 there was never a concept of dotted decimal subnet mass. So here's a few IPv6 prefix examples because in the previous slide I mentioned it's the routable portion or it depends on your your place in the network as to which bits are actually significant to you at the time. So if you're in the core of the network for instance you'll generally use a slash 48 which is an entire route prefix. Within the organization you'll use the following 16 bits after the 48 as your subnet prefix and then you'll be working with a slash 64. Of course, if you want to indicate the entire host address, then you'll use all 128 bits. So you'll use a slash 128 prefix. So IPv6 actually has an implied network prefix. So in other words, the most significant 64 bits of the address are the network portion, and the least significant 64 bits of the address are the interface ID. And that's always the case now with the address space that we're working with for IPv6. So there are different IPv6 address types. There's unicast, multicast, and anycast. Also, keep in mind that broadcast has been eliminated in IPv6. And so we'll talk more about how that's accomplished, especially when we get into the neighbor discovery portion of IPv6, because that's generally, for instance, where IPv4 used broadcast to discover neighbors using ARP. So in the unicast space, there are special addresses, 
which we'll talk about in some subsequent slides, scoped addresses. In other words, is this meant just for this link or just within your organization or internet wide? Also, the global IPv6 address space, in other words, the routable portion on the IPv6 internet, they're also referred to as aggregatable global unicast addresses. There are various different types of multicast addresses, including a special address called the solicited node address, which we'll talk about more later. Also, anycast. So anycast, I wouldn't say it's a new type of address because it's been around since the early days of IPv4. So the concept with anycast is that you're looking for the nearest device or router to you. And finally, an interesting concept with IPv6 is you assign the addresses to interfaces and not necessarily the entire nodes. So whereas with IPv4, a single node may only have one address, with IPv6, a single node, not only that, a single interface might even have multiple addresses. In fact, it does for special cases. So looking now at some IPv6 unicast address types. So I mentioned on the previous slide the aggregatable global unicast address space. All addresses starting with 001, which translates to a hex 2, comes out of that space. Link local addresses always start with FE80 slash 10. Unique local addresses, which we'll talk more about somewhat analogous to IPv4's private IP address spaces, in other words, just used within your local organization, have prefixes such as FC00-8, FD00-8, and then the multicast address space starts with FF00-16. So over the years, as we've been rolling out IPv6 address space, there was an RFC 2450 that was written that worked out of the same aggregatable global unicast address space with the format prefix set to 001, which of course would imply that the first nibble was a 2, although it could possibly be a 3, but via RFC 2540 it was actually set to just 001 and it specified the next level identifier called the TLA ID followed by a sub TLA ID and an NLA ID. TLA meaning top level aggregator, NLA meaning next level aggregator, and RFC 2450 actually set the format prefix in the TLA ID to 2001 hex. So the idea then was providers would use a sub TLA and then organizations would use the NLA to number their address spaces in the subnet. So this was interim rules. It was used for a while. It's no longer used, although there still are a lot of interfaces out there that use a 2001 prefix. And so you'll see that quite commonly in a routing table. Instead, RFC 3587 came up with a new strategy for structuring the aggregatable unicast global prefix space. So again, we're still working out of the same block, 001 prefix, but now there's a global routing prefix and an SLA, so we've relaxed some of the very specific uh, TLA, sub-TLA, NLA restrictions that were described in the previous scheme and now we're just looking at a global routing prefix which is a slash 48 and those will be the prefixes that will be given out to organizations so an organization will get a slash 48 and then that site that within that organization can use the next 16 bits for their site level aggregator in other words the subnets within their sites keeping in mind that IPv6 does have an implied address structure where the most significant 64 bits are the network side and the least significant are the hosts. So we're still operating under those restrictions as well as the, the first three bits being 001. But now the routable portion of the address is broken up into a slash 48 and then a slash 64 for organizations. One interesting concept re relative to the least significant 64 bits of an IPv6 address is the interface ID. In fact, how that interface ID is actually derived. So from RFC 4291, you actually use the Ethernet or MAC address, or what's referred to as the EUI48 address, uh, and embed it into the interface ID of the device.
And so in doing so, you create what's referred to as an EUI64 formatted address, which is 64 instead of 48 bits. And of course, 64 bits fits into the interface ID portion of the IPv6 address. So in order to derive an EUI64 from an EUI48, you start with the original MAC address, slice it open in the middle, insert the value FFFE, take the most significant byte, which I'll discuss more about that on the next slide in case you're not familiar with what I call the anatomy of a MAC address, but the most significant byte, the two least significant bits, in fact the second least significant bit is the U bit, where it's either unique or global, and we'll talk more about that on the next slide, but when you convert an EUI48 address to an EUI64, you actually invert that bit. And so whereas the MAC address might have started with 00, the EUI64 address will actually start with 02. So this slide depicts the EUI48 or MAC address and as you probably know, the most significant three bytes are the vendor ID, so in other words, the IEEE. If you uh, pay them $1,200 or so, you can get your own unique ID, and then you can use the least significant 24 bits that has 16 million combinations available, 2 to the 24th, and assign a different value to each interface that you produce. Well, in the most significant byte, there are the two least significant bits. The very least significant bit is the IG bit, the individual or group bit. And that bit is set or unset depending if it's for one or more addresses. So if it's just for one address, it's always zero. But if it's for multiple address, i.e. a broadcast or a multicast address, then that bit will be set. So the least significant bit or the most significant byte would be indicating that it's for multiple devices and not just one. Well, the second least significant is the UL bit, universal or local, meaning is this a burnt-in address? Is it universal and not duplicated anywhere in the world? Or is it configured through software, meaning that it's locally administered? Keeping in mind that this second least significant bit of the most significant byte is actually the bit that gets flipped when you map down an EUI48 address to an EUI64 address, as discussed on the previous slide. So we've talked about the different types of addresses. How are they assigned to hosts, which are talked about on this slide, and to routers, which are talked about on the next? So what type of addresses does an IPv6 host have? Well, an IPv6 host has unicast addresses. There's a special type of address now that's, ref that's called a link local address that it will assign automatically to each of its interfaces. And we'll talk more about that in part two of this series on IPv6 addressing. There's possibly other unicast and even unicast addresses that could be assigned to one or more interfaces on the device. And there's also the loopback address, which you're probably familiar with with IPv4, the 127.0.0.1, whereas with IPv6, it's just all zeros ending in one or colon colon one. There's also some multicast addresses. So previously I mentioned how IPv6 does not use broadcast anymore. So that uses a special scheme with various types of multicast addresses to accomplish the same thing that broadcast accomplished with IPv4. So there are special multicast groups, the node local, all nodes or link local, all nodes multicast addresses. There's a solicited node multicast address and various other types of multicast addresses of join groups. An IPv6 router has similar but additional addresses as an IPv6 host. So from a unicast perspective, yes, it does have link local addresses for each interfaces, unicast addresses for each interface, the loopback address. It has a special anycast address, which means any router on this subnet and then various different types of multicast addresses. The same all nodes addresses, but also all routers addresses for both node local and link local. There's also the solicited node address and various multicast addresses that the router might be joining. If it's a router, for instance, if, if it's running OSPF for IPv6, which is OSPF v3, there's a special multicast address for the all SPF routers in the IPv6 world, just as there was in the IPv4 world too. Thank you for taking the time 
for viewing this topic of the Demystifying IPv6 course on IPv6 Addressing Part 1.